Hey, what's going on YouTube? Welcome to another tutorial in our series, Building a Render Engine in C++. Today, I'd actually like to talk about something that I've been waiting to get into for a long time. I know the math that we've been doing has been really boring, but for now, hopefully, and on, for now and on, hopefully, it'll actually be a lot more entertaining. So today, I'd, I'd like to talk about uh, the core part of any render engine, and that would be the rasterizer. Um, Firstly, let's actually go over the way the rendering engine is going to work. So all the models are first going to be loaded into the system, and that's going to include data like vertex data, which is going to be positions of each vertex. So you're going to have normal surface normal data, and then texture coordinate data. Once all that data is loaded in, the programmer is going to set up a scene using that information, and it's going to be then sent to the scene for render, where it's going to take each vertex and it's going to project, it's going to take those coordinates in uh, their own relative space, it's going to transform into the model space, which is going to be transformed based on the transformation matrix, which will hold rotation, position, scale, all sorts of things. Um, it's going to transform those vertices into world space, and then from world space, it's going to then project them into the camera space, which is based on the camera's projection matrix. So. We're going to take the camera's transform position in real in the world space. We're going to invert it, then multiply each world space position by the camera's perspective matrix to get the position relative to the camera. And then after that, we are going to multiply it by a projection matrix, which is going to uh, effectively represent a two-dimensional plane, which will be the screen. So all those vertices that are in worlds or in the camera space now are now going to be represented on the in space relative to where the camera is or onto the screen effectively and then from there um, we're going to loop through all the indices in uh, of the model and we'll talk about all those we're going to go into much more detail later when we actually implement this stuff but for now I'll just tell you every model has a bunch of index data which will hold the order of the vertices to be rendered or which which vertices belong with which triangle. So we're going to loop through all the vertices, indices, excuse me, and then we're going to build triangles out of that. And then from those triangles, we're going to render them. And then all the calculations are going to be done in a vertex and fragment shader, which is we're going to simulate that. Usually that's the kind of thing that you do in hardware or in graphics hardware. But we're going to have to implement all this stuff ourselves. But the key part of all this is actually rasterization. The ability to take those vertices that are in screen space and put them onto the screen, filled in on the screen. So that's what we're going to work on today. I'll just go over a little bit of detail about how rasterizers work right now. So first of all, we're just going to have a rasterizer class that's going to hold information about the rasterizer, like the frame buffer and all that stuff. Um, and then we're going to have a single function in there for now called rasterize triangle and that's going to take in three vertices to make up a triangle. And then what we're going to do is here, let's just, I'll show you what I mean here. So these are going to be the vertices that are passed into the um, rasterizer. So you have a vertex here, a vertex here, and a vertex there. The next step in our rasterizer is going to be well, first of all, I should tell you that there are a lot of ways to accomplish the task of filling in a triangle, but we're just going to implement the simplistic way that I did in my original engine. It kind of it was more or less my naive solution, but uh, it worked out really well, so I think it's actually a good thing that we should continue to use for here. If I can optimize it in the future, I will, but it's really fast as it is, and I don't think it can get too much faster. So we're going to actually set up bounds of the triangle. And we're going to, this is going to be a minimum x value, a maximum y value, a minimum y value, and a maximum x value. So we're basically going to have a bounding box that could represent everywhere within the, anywhere in that square, any individual pixel has the potential to be rendered. And then, from there, we're just going to actually run through each of the pixels inside of this box and then test to see if it's in the triangle. The reason we created this box was to limit the number of vertices that we need to check. And I'll show you what I mean here. So if we look at each of these as an individual pixel, if I test here, it's going to say, okay, that's not in the triangle, so we'll leave it blank. 
But then when I get down here, it's going to say, okay, it's past this line, it's before the, it's past this line, and it's past this line, so therefore, it's in the triangle. And that's a process called barycentric interpolation, and we, I don't actually, um, I won't go too detailed into the math on that, but I'll leave a link in the description about how barycentric interpolation works. That's the math we're going to use to indicate whether a point inside this triangle, or whether a point is inside the triangle or not. And keep in mind, what we're looking at here is the screen itself. So um, this is these are the individual pixels on the screen, or boxes on the terminal in our case. So this is going to be individual pixels. And then finally, once you're finished, in an ideal world, all the pixels inside the triangle will be lit up, and all the ones outside the triangle won't. And I know this isn't a perfect representation of what I'm talking about, but a computer can do it more perfectly than I can. So anyway, uh, that's it for the explanation, and I'll be right back when we get right into the code. All right, welcome back. I am currently in the I am currently in the project directory, and we are going to begin working on the rasterizer. So first, let's go ahead and create a new file rasterizer.h and rasterizer.cpp and then if we go into the make file I would like to add well actually I've already done it um, I've added rasterizer.h and rasterizer.o to here and then when we compile we should see no issues and that's the case so now let's go ahead and modify rasterizer.cpp and rasterizer.h well actually do that one instead. Um, and also in a new tab, let's open up main.cpp, which we'll use later. But first, let's add our include guards. And then to start off, I'd like to add some four declarations. So um, class vector two, class vector three, class vector 4, and then class matrix matrix 44. Those are the four, four declarations that we need. And then we're also going to need another class, but we won't actually do anything with it just yet, but we'll work on it later. I'd like to create a struct for frame buffer, and we'll actually move this out of this file later. But for now, I just need it declared. So uh, this frame buffer will have a we want it to take in an int width and int height, and I'm pretty sure the frame buffer will take more in the future. But for now, let's do it like this. And because we did that, obviously we are expecting two member variables um, for width and the height. And now that those are added, we can uh, create the class rasterizer. Oops. And then for our public members, we're going to need, well, both public and private. For private, let's create a frame buffer pointer. We'll just call it FB. And then also, let's create um, void initialize frame buffer int width and then int height. We'll work on that method later, but that's all we need for that. Uh, let's create a constructor. Uh, this will just take int uh, width, int height, and we'll implement that later. And then also for this, we're definitely going to need a destructor. I'm going to make it virtual. No particular reason, but make sure it's a destructor, of course. And then we also want to include a method to get the frame buffer. So um, inline frame buffer pointer get frame buffer and then of course it's const return fb um, and then for now we're only going to make one function which will be rasterize triangle so void uh, rasterize well triangle and then this will take in a const vector 2 reference uh, v1 constructor 2 reference v2 
and then a const vector2 reference v3. That should be it for a defs file. So let's go over into here and include defs.h first of all, and then include vector vector2.h, include vector3.h, and then also vector4, and then also matrix 44.h. And then of course we want to include rasterizer.h. And once we got that out of the way, we can begin our implementation. So rasterizer, rast, rasterizer in width int height. And then to do this, we're just going to need a initialization list to have um, fb as new frame buffer width height. And then because we don't have any other members, that's actually all we need. Um, but we're not actually going to do it that way. Uh, change my mind. Because we are going to be working with this uh, initialize frame buffer function and that will probably do other things in the future. So let's just go ahead and add that as a function call instead. But in the initialization list, let's set fb to null pointer by default. And let's create a definition for rasterizer uh, initialize frame buffer, which takes an int with int height. And then this should go ahead and say fb equals new frame buffer width height. I'm just going to do that for now. And then also let's implement the destructor. Uh, and then the destructor, let's just do delete fb. And we don't even have to check to see if it's null because deleting null is perfectly fine. Alright, so with the destructor implemented, now we can go ahead and implement the big function, which will be rasterize triangle. So let's go ahead and copy this. So void uh, rasterizer, rasterize triangle. In order to do this, uh, first what we're going to want to do is actually set up the bounds. So to do that, it's going to be pretty simple. We just need to that's the reason why I included defs.h as well. So we're going to need um, int max x, uh, max, well, let's do min x, uh, max x, and then int max uh, min y, max y. So this is, these are going to be used to define our box. And then we can have min x is equal to the minimum of well, actually, the maximum of either uh, 0 or the minimum of v1.x or comma the minimum of v2.x comma v3.x. And that should actually do it for that because the way this works is it, che it gets the minimum of all of them and then it checks to see it, and then if it's less than 0, it sets it to 0, otherwise it does not. So we can actually do the same thing with uh, min y, and then of course switch all these to y's. And then finally to set the max bounds we can do the minimum of this and then f, fb uh, width as the upper bound and then fb height as the upper bound as well. But then we have to switch these to max, all of them. So that includes these two as well. The maximum of the x and of all the x's and then all the y's. And that should define our bounds. The next thing we want to do is loop through every individual pixel inside this range. Because this is, um, if we were to go back to the diagram, this is the box that I was talking about. So first I'd like to loop through all the x values. So for int i equals, actually let's do j. Let's loop with j on the outside equals min y, j is less than uh, min or max y, j plus plus. And also, let's go ahead and make one small change to the ceiling as well, um, or this uh, max function thing. Let's do, let's call seal, 
and then at the very end, let's add one to it. So the ceiling, and then add one. And the reason why I want to do that is because it will actually eliminate a bug that um, causes it to not f uh, include the last bound of the triangle. So definitely include that last one at the end. And then the ceiling function from, uh, we need to include that from math.h. All right, so with that out of the way, let's do for int i equals uh, min x, i is less than min x, i plus plus, oops, i plus plus, and then I made a mistake here. This should be i. And then our pseudocode for this is we're just going to have uh, a single function call where we're going to do if is uh, point in triangle and then we're going to pass in both i and j and then follow it with v1, v2, and v3. So if that point is within the triangle then we're going to go ahead and mv print w and the way this this is actually an ncurses function call that um, takes in first a y position followed by an x position and then followed by uh, something to print at that point. So the y position is j, the x position is i, and then we're just going to print a, a pound sign. Otherwise we're going to uh, for now mv print w j i and give it a dot. So if it is in the triangle it'll print pound otherwise it'll print dot. So if I just come up here and define a quick function. So inline uh, inline static bool is point inside triangle and then we take int i int j and then a const vector 2 reference v1 const vector 2 reference v2 v3 as well. If we take all that into account and then we just return true uh, and then let's go into for now we're just going to return true in our main.h here. Let's go ahead and include vector2.h and include rasterizer.h. And then after the screen is initialized, let's go ahead and actually create a rasterizer. So rasterizer, uh, rasterizer. We'll take in window width and then window height. Remember we defined these macros in in defs.h as lines and calls. And also, let's make one quick change here. Put surround these in parentheses. Because that is, uh, and also let's define our pi definition in parentheses as well, because that's just more correct. Uh, so yeah, we're going to use the window width and window height macros. And then, let's go ahead and define a, a small triangle range. So we can create vector2 uh, v1, v2, and v3. And actually, let's, let's construct these. So v1, we can initialize that as 0, 0. And then v2, let's initialize that as uh, 100 on the x, and then 0 on the y. And then we'll do 50 on the y, and then 50 on the x, or excuse me. 50 on the x and 50 on the y. So that will put a vertex here, here, and somewhere over here. So that'll make a triangle that looks like this. Uh, but because we don't actually have our testing to see whether it's inside the triangle or not implemented, we should just see a, a sphere, or not a sphere, a rectangle. But we need to... Um, this needs to be changed to, whoops, this needs to be changed to v3. And then also finally we need to call rasterizer uh, dot rasterize triangle. And then we need to pass in v1, v2, v3. So now if we run this, Uh, MV print T is what I wrote when it should have been MV print W. So, pr 
print w. All right. Um, we also need to do one small thing. Um, wait, but we are calling getch. So what is the issue here? In rasterize triangle. Let's go ahead and. Hmm. So print w. Mv print w. Uh, min y comma min x. We'll just put a hashtag here and then max y max x. So we have a box here and the other one is nowhere to be seen. Okay. Okay, so it looks like I did not change these variables. So we need max x and then max y. There we go. So we have these two bounds selected here. And now let's see why we're not seeing a filled in shape. So I, is point in, in triangle is returning true no matter what. So. All right, so the problem was actually very simple. What we need to do is come over here to this i is less than variable, and we need to switch this to less than max x instead of min x. And then when we run this, uh, there we go. We have a giant block of filled in area. So now what we need to do is actually implement this point inside triangle function. And uh, this is gonna be a little bit of mathematics, so I'm going to go ahead and actually copy it. I'm just going to copy the entire function. There we go. And this is what barycentric interpolation looks like. It's effectively getting these weight values, and you can think of these weight values as what percentage of each vertex the point is. So it's taking it's getting the the weight for vertex one, the weight for vertex two, and then vertex obviously all the weights need to add up to one, so it's taking um, one minus all these weights added together, uh, essentially because this is just the distributive property. Uh, one minus this plus this, and then you distribute it, and then you get one minus this minus that. So that is the third weight, and then we're going to go ahead and check to see if this is less than 0 0.001 and the reason why this is not zero is because I wanted to add just a little bit of bias to it, um, a bias towards the outside of the, the triangle because this is just checking to see if it's crossed the line essentially. I'm adding just a little bit of bias towards it saying that it's within the triangle because I'd rather it render a point that shouldn't be rendered then not render a point that should be rendered. And you'll see, now I can actually show you the difference between this here. So if I remove this and then set this to zero for all of these, and I render it, uh, is point inside triangle, I called it something different here. Let's fix that. So there you go. Um, you'll see that on this first line, uh, you'll notice that this is not rendered, this is not rendered. Even though this is a completely straight line, not every part of this triangle is rendered. So to fix that, we add this bias. And you can clearly see the difference now that this entire line is filled. And let's go ahead and do just a few more tests to make sure that this is working exactly as it's supposed to. So. Let's go ahead and move this point down to 10 on the x, and then let's say eh, 0 on the y is probably all right. And then let's go ahead and move this next coordinate to 50 on the x, and um, 10 on the y, and then this last coordinate to 140. And there you go, you can see that it's able to take any ver set of vertices and create a simple triangle from that data. And that is the essence of a rasterizer. We'll have to build on this for later, but uh, for now this is all we are going to do. So I'll see you all next time. 
Right before I actually end this tutorial, I just wanted to actually show you something that you can do with this. And it's not actually how we're going to be using it during the project, but it is really a sample of how powerful these matrix transformations can be. And I really want you to have a good understanding of them before moving on to the next tutorial. That way, if you want to play around with it, you can. And it's no big deal. So right here I defined the matrix 44 called transformation and then I defined the vertices as this time a vector 4 and notice how these coordinates are 1 the reason why those are 1 is actually um, for a reason in it's because in linear algebra um, these matrix transformations rely on you having to do math with a vector 4 and with these coordinates being 1 these would actually affect how the intensity at which the transformations in the matrix uh, are performed. It's called homogeneous coordinates and I, I would recommend you look into that a little bit as well if you're interested. But by taking these coordinates I can multiply them each by the transformation and then when I call rasterized triangle I'm just converting the x and y coordinate of these things to vector 2's. So um, I'll just go ahead and show you what this code does it rasterizes a triangle, same as what we did before, but here I'm going to uh, change something slightly. If I go ahead and move this down to 20 and then make this 15 uh, and then I run this, you'll notice how this triangle is a little bit thin, so I'm going to fix this with a matrix transformation. I'm going to go transformation dot scale and then I'm going to pass in uh, vector 2 two on the x-axis, one on the y, and then one on the z. And what this is going to do is it's going to multiply the x-coordinates by two and the y-coordinates by one, so this triangle will actually be much more of a square. Uh, no function to call. Oh, This actually does need to be a vector three, so just go ahead and fix that. So now it turns it back into a square. It effectively multiplied all the x-coordinates by 2. So let's take it up to another notch and this time multiply it by 5. And you can clearly see that as I'm doing this it's multiplying it by 5. And you'll also notice that it's shifting over to the right. And the reason why it's doing that is because the way these coordinates work is you're going to have effectively coordinates that are 0 to 1. 1 being up here in the top uh, negative 1 being down here, 1 being over here, and then negative 1 being here. And um, because this thing is 0, 0 is over here, by scaling this triangle, these triangles vertices, they're going to be scaled more and more to the right, if that makes any sense. So we're actually not going to be using screen, coordinate, screen pixel coordinates in the future. We're actually going to be modifying it so that it's instead um, our own little coordinate system. And we'll get into that in a future tutorial. But scaling isn't the only thing I can do. I can also do transformation dot um, rotate, and if I get the options for this, we have um, vector three, and then you give it an axis to rotate it um, across one axis. You'd give it like across because you can think of this as rotating it along around the axis. So the z-coordinate, think of it as coming straight towards the screen. If you do that, it's going to rotate it like this in a clockwise direction. Or counterclock, I'm not quite sure. I'm pretty sure it's clockwise, though. And then this next uh, argument is the degree, so uh, angle. And this is going to take radians, so do gen math uh, to radians. And then pass in an angle of um, 45 degrees. And then if we go ahead and run this, you'll notice that it now looks very different. Let's uh, actually make this like five degrees so you can actually see. So notice how it's rotated so that this this box is not at an angle, but the triangle within the box is at an angle. Let's make it uh, like 15 degrees. <clears throat> you can clearly see that as the angle is increasing, so the the triangle is rotating around and all these vertices are staying relative to the center at zero, zero. Um, let's go ahead and actually make this angle and then loop for as long as angle is less than 360 and then we can see what happens when we actually go around. So I press the button and the angle increases. So you can see this coordinate is staying exactly perpendicular, well, 
linear to this. All the coordinates are all still pointing at this one direction as they go around. And that's the, that's the key. That's the key to how rotation works. And obviously it's going off of the screen, so you are not going to really be able to see too much when it's on that side. But we'll modify that later so that it works. Uh, maybe it'll appear soon. There we go. So yeah, that's the key. And not only can you scale things and rotate them, I'm going to make this one again, you can also translate it. So I can do transformation.translate, and then I can give it a vector 3. Um, well, let's move it a, um, down the screen by 10. So 0, 10, 0. So without that once again, if we set this to 0, you can clearly see that it moved from here down to there. Let's make it a bit more intense. Yeah, and that's how you can actually, I thought I'd show you that because it's really, it's the first actually cool part of the tutorial series. And I figured I'd, I'd leave that with you for this time and you can mess around with that and get really good at it for our next tutorial where we're actually going to be potentially using it. I'm still not sure what we're going to do with that tutorial yet, but it might just be frame buffers. We'll see though. Uh, with, that in, with that out of the way, I'll see you all next time.